Well, church, again this morning, take your Bible and open it to the book of the Revelation. The first chapter we're going to reading it, uh, begin our reading at uh, verse 9. This is our third message in the series called The Conclusion about Revelation. We started with Daniel to show the connectedness between the Daniel, the vision that God gave Daniel and how this really with John is the completion, the fulfillment of that vision that Daniel couldn't see because he couldn't see the church. And um, we're looking at that 70th week. We're going to be in days to come. Stand with me if you would. I'm going to begin reading uh, there in verse 9. When we get down to verse 19, we'll read it together off the monitor. Let your eyes start at verse 9. This is the first of the visions that John receives. He says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. The voice was saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. And his voice as a sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the, shining, the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his, hand, his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Read with me verse 19. Write these things which he have seen, the things which are and the things which will take place after this. Now notice what is there big in front of you. We're going to see it again in a moment at the end of the message. There's... Three things, right? The things have seen, things are the things that will be after this. Now, Father, as we stand under the authority of your word, we're awed as John sees Jesus again and writes for us that which he sees. God, we see the reigning Christ, glorious, glorious, alive forevermore, never again. To be ridiculed, spit upon, mocked, or crucified. But ruling and reigning, bringing to a conclusion these days, these times, when like on the days of Noah were marked, these days are marked, when one day holiness will say, mercy and grace sit down, while holiness, righteous wrath and judgment will come upon a rebellious earth and rebellious people, and sin will be judged finally and forever. Father, today we ask your Holy Spirit to be our teacher, to help us see what you're saying and hear what you're saying, and we'd receive it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, and be seated if you would. <clears throat> now over the years, as a pastor, I, I've found illustrations over the years that... Um, I just really like. You guys have heard them several times. I've been here almost 11 years, finished, I'm about to finish 11 years. But just imagine how many times my family's heard them. <laughs> but one of my favorite illustrations comes out of the Old West, maybe here in Texas. Back in the horse and buggy days, there was a young man on the street of town and a child was in a bug board and something spooked the horses and the horses took off with the child in the bug board. Young man jumped on his horse. He rode that buggy down and he stopped it and he saved the child's life and he brought it back to town. That young man that was the rescuer grew up to be a judge. The young child in the buggy grew up to be a criminal. He was caught and he was about to be condemned to death. But as he went to trial, he looked and who was there except his childhood hero? And his thoughts were, hey, he saved me once. Now he's going to get to do it again. So as he came before the judge and all the, uh, the uh, evidence was given, 
The young boy, in hopes it would be to his favor, reminded him and said, Judge, remember that time as a young man you jumped on a horse and run down a wagon and saved that boy? The judge said, yes, I certainly do. The boy said proudly, I'm that boy. I'm that boy. The judge looked at him and said to him these words that are so appropriate for today. Son, on that day I was your Savior, but today I'm your judge. How do you see Jesus? How do you see Jesus? When you pray, how do you see Him? When you think about Him, where do your thoughts go? Now, it's been some 65 years since John saw Jesus in the flesh. Now, think about it. John, one of those early disciples, one of the beloved, he saw the highs and the lows, the great, all the great miracles of Jesus. He saw everything. Firsthand eyewitness he sees. He's even standing at the foot of the cross when he looks up and sees Jesus bloodied and beaten and spit upon and humiliated. But he's also there that day as he stands and he watches Jesus mount the clouds and says, I'm coming back just like I'm leaving. I'm coming back. But some 65 years have passed. And now John sees Jesus again. But this time, he sees him as he is forevermore. Time immemorial. This is who Jesus is. It's who he will be forever and ever and ever. John sees him. And Daniel was told, see these things and seal them up. John was told, see these things, write them and send them to the churches. So this morning, if you want to fill in the outline, let's start by looking at the messenger as we're talking about John there in verse 9 in the first part of verse 10. We see those words, I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulations and troubles. Now, the person we know is John. John uh, is a little different in his uh, identifying of himself here. In his gospel, at the end of his gospel, he identifies himself as the one whom Jesus loved, that leaned on Jesus and he was the beloved disciple. To his epistles, he addresses them as the elder and the eyewitness of the one. But here, nothing about elder, eyewitness, apostle. He just refers to himself as companion, and brother. He says, I'm your brother. No elevated place. He said, not only am I your brother, I'm your companion in the kingdom of God and in the tribulations. While the church is going to be spared from that great tribulation as it's called the time of Jacob's trouble, the church has and will know tribulations and trials of our own. Not of God, wrath upon the church but because of a world that hates God and hates His people. And Jesus said, if they hated me, they'll hate you. And so we endure in these days as the church of the Lord Jesus, the tribulation of the world against God and against His people. John says, it is the patience of Christ, that waiting on Christ's return, that unites us as brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God, anticipating and waiting for that day when the tribulation against the church will end forever. He mentions the place. He says, I was on the isle that is called Patmos. That island that at its widest point is six miles wide and ten miles long, some 15 miles off the coast of Ephesus out in the Aegean Sea. It was created by volcanic activity, just a rocky place that Rome had used as a, a prison to, to place people there. And there he was, uh, bound up by Rome, but freed by the Lord God. I couldn't help but as I thought about this, how Daniel's revelation came right after he was delivered from the lion's den. The Apostle Paul wrote many of his letters there in prison. Here John is writing on Patmos that while persecution and trials may have come, that God is still at work. Many times trials come to our life and it shuts us down. It somehow uh, our, our eyes and our heart grows cold to heaven as though God is to blame for the trouble and the trial and as though that in the living of these days we should never anticipate or expect any uncomfortable or any unhappy or unpleasant pleasant thing. John there on the Isle of Patmos sees God, sees the Lord Jesus and gives for us that last word that God has for His churches for all time. 
The purpose for his exile, he tells us there in verse 2, for the word of God and for the testimony of the Lord Jesus. Same thing will get you in trouble today too. You share the word of God everywhere you go. You testify to the grace and goodness of Jesus long enough and you'll find people that it really hacks off. And they'll turn that anger, they'll turn that, that attitude towards you. I can remember it like it was yesterday. I surrendered to preach. I was in the Air Force. I had surrendered to preach. And, and I, I got getting active there in our church in San Antonio. And me and another young man about my age was going to go. We showed up on Monday night visitation. We were given an address and told to go there. And, and to these people, somebody in the home had visited our church. And we were going to go. And we were going to visit maybe if, uh, share the gospel if they didn't know Christ or give them a word of encouragement. And, and we walk up to the door. <laughs> and a man opens the door. And I said, hello, I'm Tony. This is Mike. We're from Salem Sarah's Baptist Church. And the dude grabs the door with two hands. He raises his foot and he steps into it with great form. And he slams the door. Boom! And it just rattled in the frame. But as he went to, I heard him say, I'm a Methodist. Boom! <laughs> now, I wasn't that sanctified. My first thought was far less than spiritual. My first thought was, I wonder if that lock could withstood the, foot, the force of my foot if I kicked it in. And wanted to say to him, I don't know what you claim, but you ain't much of nothing, dude. That's what I wanted to say. But I restrained my words, and as I walked to the car, the Spirit of God said to me, Was he offended at you or at me? And there in just a short walk to my car, God taught me something. You come bearing my name. I offend sinful people. I offend wicked people. I offend people who don't love me or care about my ways. Just get out of the will of God. You can't stand to be around Christians. It'll drive you crazy. You try to live carnal and ungodly, you get around a bunch of Christians, they'll just, they'll just wear you out. Why? They don't have to say a word. It's Christ in them is all it takes. Some of you wonder why somebody at work just really don't like you. I've been kind. I, I, I've been good to them. I've been kind. Well, get over yourself. It's never been about you. I took a shower. I sprayed on some foo-foo juice. I, I, I was clean. I was ready to go. I walked out. There wasn't nothing offensive about me. I mentioned a church. Something might be spiritual. John said, I was in the Isle of Patmos for the Word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. If you're living your life today thinking that because you're a Christian, everything good is going to happen to you today. Nothing bad is going to come your way. I don't know what Bible you're reading, but it's not the one that the Holy Spirit authored and gave to the church. John says, I was the beloved disciple. I have that highest and greatest identification of any of the twelve. I'm called the one that Jesus loved. I was one of the inner three. And yet here I am on this rocky prison, suffering, no shelter, just the elements. And why am I here? What dastardly deed have I done? I spoke the word of God and I gave testimony to Jesus as Savior and Lord and Messiah of the earth. Notice the practice of his worship. He says there, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Isn't it amazing? Today, thousands of people are not in church today, and you know why? Some hard thing, some hurtful thing, some troubling thing came to their life, and they're so taken back by it, they can't find church because they're upset. Some of them are mad at God. Boy, I hope he, can, hope he don't ruin his day. Now, I'm not trying to be callous or unkind, but I'm trying to make the point that we want to lay at God's feet every hurtful and bad thing which is because of the living of these days. We live in a fallen world where twice born people in a once born world. What do we expect? If they traded Jesus, the Prince of glory, the Prince of goodness, the Prince of kindness, the Prince of redemption, the Prince of love, if they treated Him with that despite and crucified Him, why in the world? We see John, he's on Patmos. Maybe every reason, God, why am I? Look, God, I've been, I'm the beloved. Lord, look, why am I here? But we don't find John uh, deterred by any of that. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. The church fathers, right after the apostolic period, 
refer to this as the first reference of Sunday being the Lord's Day. It's often just called the first day of the week. But we can go back through the New Testament. We find it was the day that the church worshipped instead of the Sabbath. Jesus fulfilled the Sabbath rest and redemption. And Sunday, the day of his resurrection, became the day of worship for the church. And John says, on that day, when it came that day, I don't care where I was, I don't care what I was going through, it was time for me to worship. It was time for me to worship, and I worshiped. I was in the spirit of the Lord. I was, I was there in the midst of all this tribulation and trial. You know, we, we, we live in two worlds all the time, don't we? We live in the world, but we're not of the world. We're seated in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus. The Bible talks about us already being there, that we're pilgrims here and strangers because we are residents of heaven. It's like the old cobbler who was asked, he had a workshop and an apartment above it, and they asked him about that situation. He said, well, you see, I work down here, but I live up there. Uh, that's how it is for us. We work down here, but we live up there. So John said, I was in Patmos, but I, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. What does it take to get you to quit worshiping? What does it take to, to get you to take your eyes off the goodness and grace of God? You see, if some little trial, some little trouble bothers you, boy, Satan's always going to make sure you, you find something to, to keep you distracted and keep your eyes off of him. I believe that's why... This very, this very vision, this first vision of John, I believe is why Satan has tried to close Revelation for so many people. He don't want us to see Jesus the way John's about to present Jesus to us. He don't want us to see him like that. Little trials and troubles and problems. What does it take to get you to quit? I, I still hear it. It rings in my ears from my youth. An old coach, when you get hot and tired and, and just wore out, he said, boys, we'll find out how committed you are about how little it takes to make you quit. And he'd say that and we'd suck it up and go another, another round, go a little farther. Not quit. I'm not quitting. I'm not quitting. The only thing I'm going to quit is quitting. I'm not quitting. I quit quitting. John says, here I am on the Isle of Patmos in the midst of the worst the Roman Empire could vision for me. And what does God do? He works all things together for my good and for the good of the church of all time. He meets me here in the place of tribulation. He meets me here in the place of trouble. And he says, let me speak to you today spiritual truth, spiritual insight that will elevate you from where you work to where you live. Well, starting at the second half of verse 10, we see the message that he's given. He said, I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in the book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. He says, first of all, I heard, as it were, a sound of a trumpet, a voice of many waters. The trumpet's used all through Scripture to call people together, to, to give the command, to give a, in, in war and in battle. Like even in Calvary days, the trumpet sound was, was heard and everybody knew the command because they could hear the command of the trumpet. It was often used to gather at Mount Sinai. The trumpet was blast, the shofar was blown, and the people of God gathered to receive the message. One day the Bible says with a voice and the trumpet of God, the church is going to be called out, gathered up, and taken away. And then even at the end of the tribulation, the trumpet of God and the dead are going to be raised and judged the trumpet call John said I heard a trumpet he was used to the imagery he could understood, understand it he knew exactly what he was thinking about but he says I turned to see the voice now I want to take a minute and just say here's my beef with so many people reading Revelation they, can't, they don't do like John John said I heard a voice so I turned to, to gather I want to see them what, what is it what are, you, what are you saying John didn't say wow how did he make that sound Why, how did he get wonder how he got so loud I can't, can you imagine how loud how did he do that do you care no. No. <laughs> boy when I, when I read over there when there's a scorpion with a tail and it shoots fire I wonder if that's a helicopter shooting rockets I don't care. I don't care. This is how we need to read Revelation. Not get asking a thousand how did he do that senseless questions, but what is happening? What is the purpose? What is he saying? That is what matters. Amen. That is the message. John said, I received a message, and it's a message I want to give. It's a message Jesus said, hear this and write it. 
and send it to my people. Jesus is saying something to us. This isn't, Revelation is not some enigma wrapped up in a riddle of, of the history of time just for uh, the fancification of our minds. How, how does he do that? How's it, going, how's it going to be? What's he going to do? I wonder if it was those in the days of Noah, seven chapters into the Bible. Sin is so bad, God says, I'm going to start over. As Noah, for those years, preached judgment of God that was coming. Noah's building an ark. God's going, you imagine, said, how's God going to do that? It don't even rain. It just, do, the waters do, the dew waters are grass. What, what, how, flood. How's he going to do that? You see, they got caught up in the how instead of what God was saying. As we go through Revelation, we're going to see a lot of symbolism. Can you imagine a first century man seeing the last century and with the first century vocabulary describing it? With the aid and help of the Holy Spirit, he still had his first century vocabulary. So we're going to see a lot of imagery. And if, that, if that's what hooks you up, if that's what really gets your attention, wonder, wonder, what that's going, wonder what it's going to look like. Wonder, 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 wonder. Why don't we just lay the wonder down at the symbols and be awed at the wonder of what he's saying and what's going to happen and what's taking place. He says, I heard. Notice he says, write these things and send them to the seven churches. Now we're going to look at the seven churches next Sunday in detail. I'm just going to hit them uh, briefly here. Now, there's a lot of discussion about the seven churches, and most of it all, it, it all right. Uh, it's, it, it's the emphasizing of one over the other that gets people in trouble. Uh, if you were on Patmos and you went, you would go to Ephesus. That's the seaport. And these churches are given in a circular uh, order that the, when John sent the letter to the churches and it made its way, it went to Ephesus. Then it turned to Smyrna. Then it went to Pergamos. Then it came south to Thyatira. Then it came to Sardis. Then it came to Philadelphia and last to Laodicea. Seven churches, little churches in existence. There's those who've looked at these seven churches and they've said, well, these churches represent seven epochs of time. And that they, they are understanding that, uh, that, that that's how they're to be understood. Well, you can look back in history and if you take very shallow view, you might can find how in periods of time like the period right after the apostles, the Ephesus church, they lost their first love. You could see that. You could come on to Smyrna, the persecuted church. You could come on down to Thyatira, to, to the, to the uh, Roman uh, papal church. You, you can see all of those, but I remind you, all seven of these churches existed in that one day. I'm going to submit to you that all seven of those churches exist today. Next Sunday, we're going to bow down on the thought that all seven of those kind of Christians are members of Faith Fellowship today. What is the church? It's the sum total of the people that make it up. He said, I want you to write these letters and I want you to send it to the churches. We're going to look and see. It's the word churches. It's not the word church. There is no church of Asia. There were the churches. When Jesus talks about the church in the abstract, he uses the word church. On the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. But when it moves from the abstract to the organized, it's always churches, individual congregations, individual, independent, if you will, answerable to God and answerable to the Lord Christ, who's the head of the church. There is no church of America. There's the churches of America. There's no church of Athens. There's the churches of Athens. We are one of those churches with pastor, deacons, leaders, the congregation, us being led by the Spirit of God, making decisions and walking in the will of God for us as His people. Jesus said, look, I want to send you to these seven churches. And we've already talked about that word seven, how it means completion and fruition. And it's talking about the church of all time and the, the church of a completion. Now, if you want to look back in history and see periods of time that you think match up with this, that's okay. But to say that it has no word for us today only, is, only was there for a historical perspective, uh, 
vehemently disagree. Jesus gave a word to the churches that's for us today. It's for us today. And we're going to see in these churches characteristics. We're going to see a little more about them here in just a minute as John describes Jesus. But notice in verse 12 and 13, he talks about the master's position. His position. I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands were one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. We see his position. Standing in the midst of the churches, here the word church is plural. In the Old Testament temple, there was a lampstand. It was one lampstand that came up and divided off, and it had 12 lamp pools, oil pools. For one nation, Israel. But John sees Jesus. There's not one church with seven branches. No, no. It's seven lampstands. He's walking in the midst. He's standing in the midst of his churches. Remember when Jesus said, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm with you always. John sees Jesus. And where is he? He's in the midst of the churches. He's here today. He's in the midst of his church. And everywhere people gather to preach the truth of God and to worship the true God, he's there in the midst. And John sees him in the midst of his churches. Again, church is plural, not singular. He says, I see him. What, what does he see? One like the Son of Man. John refers here to his humanity. It was Jesus' favorite way to refer to himself. Eighty-five times in the Gospels, the Son of Man is used. Eighty-one times Jesus used him of himself. Speaking about his, the, the mankind that he came to redeem. These churches that he's standing in the middle of. He came as the man of God to be the sacrifice, to die on the cross, to pay for our sin, that we might be ecclesia, the church, ek, out, klaseo, called out. And we are called out of the world. We're called by the Holy Spirit of God at the gospel to come out of the world, to come to Christ, to make him Lord and Savior of who we are. We are the ecclesia, the church. Jesus in the midst of the churches because he came as a redeemer, the savior, the lamb of God, that there might be a called out people. And there he is in the midst of his churches showing his sovereignty and his lordship and his rule and his reign over his churches. He's the head of the church. and We are the body of which he is the head. Sovereign Lord over all that he's purchased with his own blood. John said, I saw him. There, he, he talks first of all about his um, the clothes that he's wearing, his function, his clothes of function. Look at verse 14. Well, no, I'm sorry, verse 13. Look, he said, garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with golden bread. He sees the clothing of his function. We know the priest wore the garments, the, the, the robe. The king would have the robe, but he would also have the golden sash. And the judge, even our judges today wear robes. We see him as prophet. I'm sorry, we see him as priest, as king, and as judge. He's wearing the garments of his function. He is and he will be for all time king, priest, and judge. But then he goes from the position to his portrayal. Look at verse 4, 14, I'm sorry. His head and his hair were white like wool and as white as snow. John is going to give now a seven, seven descriptors. There's that number seven again. He's going to describe Jesus in seven things that he sees. And we're going to see when we get to the churches, every one of these things, these descriptors are used as Jesus refer, refers himself and references himself to his church. But take a moment and look now. Now think about it. Think about the ways that John has seen Jesus. He saw Jesus with a towel around himself washing feet one day. He saw Jesus sitting and saying, Suffer the little children to come to me, forbid them not, for such kingdom of heaven. And he sees Jesus mobbed by the babies and children and loving on them and hugging them and getting them up in his lap and blessing them, loving on them. 
He saw Jesus stand at Lazarus' tomb and bawl his eyes out and weep for Lazarus as he saw what sin ultimately brought man to. As I said earlier, he saw Jesus beaten and bloodied, nailed to a cross, fighting for his last breath, hearing him cry out, It is finished. John saw all of that. But it's been 65 years since he saw him mount the, 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 the clouds and leave. Somewhere between 90 and 95 is John is there on Patmos. He sees Jesus again. But oh, he's never seen him like this before. Because he's seen him now glorified. Glorified. Return to that place of the Father that He left willingly to come and be the Son of Man and the Son of God. He says, first of all, He saw Him, His head and hair white. Speaking of His purity of thought, white like snow and like wool reminds us of the first chapter of Isaiah. Though your sins be like crimson, they shall be white as wool. They'll be white as snow. It talks about His the elevation of his thoughts, his ways are not our ways, his wisdom, the omniscience of the glorified Christ. He sees him. Now, if we were to go back to Daniel chapter 7, chapter 10, and chapter 12 and put together the, the, the visions of Daniel, it is absolutely, I started to say uncanny, but it's exactly what you'd expect with the Spirit of God author in both places, wouldn't you? Daniel sees the exact same vision that J John sees. It's just that John sees him and understands him in a way that Daniel never did. Number two, he sees his eyes as a fire. Talking about his omniscience. There's a couple of passages in the Scripture that are especially poignant to that point that Jesus is seen by John with these eyes. Now John had seen these eyes weep. John had seen these eyes look with compassion. John had seen these eyes, but now, like never before, he sees these eyes aflame with justice, aflame with righteousness, aflame with holiness, and a set of duracy against sin. He sees the very judgment that's about to come on this earth. And I'm reminded of Hebrews chapter 4. The Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and a discerner of thoughts and intents. Listen, and there is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him with whom we will give an account. We cover sin under the dark of night. We cover sin under the privacy of walls and closed doors. We sneak around and we try to keep sin out of the eyes of others. When all the while, the flaming eyes of God see Christ, see everything. There's no escaping the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. And here's the greater truth. He not only sees the outward act, He sees the thought and intent of the heart that did it. He knows. He knows. Seven times He's going to say to a church, I know. I know, I know, I know. Do you hear it this morning? Jesus knows me. He knows you. He knows Faith Fellowship Church. He knows all about us. He knows that that we don't want anybody else to know. He knows already. We're naked and open before the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, that gifted but troubled church. And he says that one day we're going to stand before the Bema seat judgment, that Olympic stand, that three-position stand that you see in the Olympics. That's the Bema. That's where it comes from, out of the Greek Olympics. They're standing on the Bema. What? Everybody on that Bema gets a reward. You're not there unless you're getting something. It may not be gold. It may not be silver, but you're getting bronze. You're getting something. Nobody on this thing is leaving without some reward. Paul looks ahead in time and says, one day we're going to stand on the Bema of Christ. Everybody, it's there for reward. It's not there for punishment. It's there for reward. All of us, our life is going to be there before us. And all of our life, the foundation of our life is the Lord Jesus. Our life is built brick by brick 
work by work, deed by deed, thought by thought, everything we do is built a brick in the house. Some of the bricks are wood, hay, and stubble. Some of the bricks are gold, silver, and precious stone. And there's going to be that thing called Tony's life as I stand on the beam of Christ and the fiery gaze of Christ will try it. What does fire do to wood, hay, and stubble? Immediately, it's gone. And what's left? Gold, silver, and precious stone. That which was done, not only that which was rightly done, that was right to be done, but it was done rightly. My motive, my intentions, my everything about why I was doing it was honoring to Christ. It was for His glory, for His, His honor, and in His name. That fiery gaze, that fiery judgmental look of Christ. Today, Christ looks at us. And the eyes He looks with are eyes that penetrate and pierce all of our excuses, all of our justifications, all of our rationales. Tony, I know you. You're an open book to me. That's not always comforting. But I'm really glad. Because I've got enough shuckster in me that if I thought I could shuck and jive, I'd try. But I'm reminded over and again, ain't no shuck and ain't no jive at the throne of God. Amen. He sees and He knows. But be, ble be blessed by the thought. He knows me and still He loves me. He knows me, and still He loves me. For a good man, some might dare to die, but not for no good man. For a wretched man, a sinful man, a bad man, He loved me and died. That He might save me and redeem me and make something of me that I had no hope of ever being in and of and by myself. He goes from the eyes to his feet or fine brass. Brass always speaks of judgment. He speaks of the feet of brass. That one day, Jesus' feet of brass is going to trod the kingdom of this world. Remember, go all the way back to Genesis. Are you there with me? When God is talking to Adam and Eve who've sinned, and he's, he's uh, giving the curse upon the serpent, what does he say? He says, one day the seed of Eve is going to bruise your head. You're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. That bite of the serpent may have held on there in Calvary to the feet of flesh. But when they got glorified, they turned the feet of brass and the serpent had to turn loose. And that heel of brass is going to crush his head. It's going to judge him and the kingdom of this world with a, a fury and a wrath that is only equal to the holiness of God and his set up duracy, his said his hatred towards all sin. He says uh, he has a voice of many waters. A voice of many waters. It's a picture of two things. It's a picture, first of all, of all the messages of all time, of every prophet, every evangelist, every missionary that Christ sent out. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1 says, in, in many ways and in diverse manners in the past time, you spoke through the prophet. There was many messages, but like the little tributaries and creeks that run into the mighty river and make it a great river, all of those run into the one message of Christ. There's one message, there's one voice, and it's His. It's His gospel of grace and goodness. There's a holy God that saves sinful man, that God is a holy God and cannot and will not condone and accept sin. But he sent his own son that through him sin might be forgiven and atoned. He said he had a voice of many waters, all of the messages, many messages, but one message, and it comes to Christ. But it's the sound of many waters. Sometimes I see us like the guy that stood at the bottom of the Niagara Falls and tried to argue with it. If you've ever been there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You can't hear yourself think. The sound is deafening. You see, there is that about us. We, we want to argue. Oh, yeah, but God, you know, but God, remember, but God, you know, but God, but God, well, yeah, but God, but, yeah, but you know, yeah, but. And uh, the voice says, hush all of that. All of that's over. All of that silence. I know you. I know all about you. I know what you want to say. I know how you want to rationalize your sin. I'm not receiving it. I'm not hearing it. 
And he's going to shut down every argument, every retaliation, every voice that would excuse and somehow accuse him in his holiness. It's the voice that stops all mouths and shuts all before him. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If it's your tendency to get loud when your argument is weak, it's going to meet its ultimate failure one day in him. You can't get out, you can't out loud him. You can't out loud him. And one day that mighty voice is going to shut down every other voice. And that single message from that single messenger is going to reverberate through the universe to all that he speaks to and all that he says. Now in his right hand, the hand of authority, that nail-pierced hand, we see these seven stars. Now, this is one of the places where the Word of God interprets itself. In verse 20, look down to verse 20. We didn't read it because we were going to look at it. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angelios, the messengers of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. And there's a lot of discussion over the angelios, the, the messengers. Sometimes that word is translated message. In the Old Testament, the word for angelios the Hebrew word is Malik. When the Septuagint translated the Old Testament into Septuagint Greek, they translated Malak for Angelios, and it means messengers. And from time to time, it's an angel. An angel stood by Manoah, and he uh, proclaimed the, the birth of Samuel. There at the, at the temple by Zechariah, an angel appeared, and he prophesied to Zechariah the birth of John the Baptist. But over and again, but over and again, the word Angelios, the word Malak, is of a messenger that God has sent. He's put a message in him, and he sent him out, and he said, go speak for me to my people. If you go to Haggai chapter 1, Haggai says, I am the Malak, the Angelios of God. Malachi's very name is off the root Malak. He says three times in his book, uh, he talks about the messenger, the Malak, the Angelios, the messenger. He says himself, he's the messenger of God. He says that the priest in chapter 2 are the angelios, the malak, the messengers of God. And he says that there's coming a day when one is going to come as the angelios and he's going to prepare the way. Speaking of John the Baptist, he calls him the angelios, the messenger of God. Some would say, no, these are angels that God has, every church has an angel. Lord, help him, right? I, I, I can't go there. If we'll look at the letters, we'll see why. In each of the seven letters, it is addressed to the angelios and the church. And on all but two occasions, he says, I have this against you. You failed me. You've sinned. That wouldn't apply in any way to an angel. I believe it's talking about the position of God called men to be his messenger. That first task of any, uh, of, the, of a leader of the church is to speak the message of God, to preach the word of God. That he might preach forth that message that Christ has put in and send it forth. He says they are the stars. Stars are used to guide and to reflect. Daniel chapter 12 verse 3 says that those who share the gospel, those that win souls are wise and they shine as stars in the firmament. What we know is this. John sees the churches of the Lord Jesus of all times, of all days. And we see him holding in the right hand of authority his leaders. One guy said he holds them out, he holds them up, and he holds them fast. Amen. I can tell you, I can tell you I've known the holding hand of God, the holding hand of Christ in my ministry. He's held me up when I want to sit down and quit. He's held me fast when I wanted to run and leave. And He's held me out. He's held me out to people to hear and to receive from Him. Like that Thessalonica church when Paul writes and he says, You receive from me as it truly is not the word of man, but the word of God. I came to you as the messenger, the angelios. 
but you realize the message was not from man. The message was from God. The messenger may be human, but the message is eternal and divine. We'll receive it and we'll value it as that. He sees him there in that place of authority. Look at his mouth, that sharp two-edged sword. It talks of the power of the delivered message. That two-edged sword. That gospel that goes forth and some is to life and to others is to death. To the one who receives the gospel is to eternal life. But the one who rejects it, Jesus said, not only will my life, and what he said to the Pharisees, my words will judge you. My very words are going to judge you one day. He said he talks about that two-edged sword. A two-edged sword was a relatively new invention because of the weakness of steel. Only one edge would be sharpened and they would hack with it. But it was the Romans who got the better steel and they sharpened, they shortened it and they sharpened it on both sides. And man, they could slut and cut and dice and slice like no other army. They were known, they were referred to as the short swords. And it was that sharp two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. As it's wielded, as it's yielded. It's the, it's the two-edged sword that goes out, the, the message that's proclaimed. We're going to see it again on that day of judgment when, when the earth gather to fight against Christ and he goes out, great victor and, and reign and rule. He conquers them by the word of his mouth. It goes out like a two-edged sword. And to me it cut into my sin and it cut my sin away and it removed my sin from me as he surgically forgave me and redeemed me. But to others... It's the cut of death because they rejected His gospel. They rejected His grace. It's a two-edged sword. Paul says to some it's the gospel of life. To others it's the gospel of death. In every church, every Lord's Day, all through the week as people share the gospel here and there as we go, as we share Christ wherever we are, to some it's the gospel of life. They hear and they receive. But to others it's the gospel of death. We're going to see at the end of our study there's coming a time when that person is going to stand before, Christ, before God on His eternal white throne and He's going to see every time that gospel came across His ears and He rejected it. He can't say, I didn't know. I didn't hear. But, but you know, you should have said it in a more convincing way. I said it to you like I said to everybody else. The rich man in hell said, do something fantastic. Send back Lazarus. Lord, do something that'll get your wow. God, do something that'll just really, just really, whoo. I said, no. They have Moses and the prophets. They have my word. If they don't hear them, they won't hear even if I send somebody back from the dead because they're listening for the wrong reason. They're not listening to my grace and my hope and my mercy. Many listen every Sunday to find fault and to find places where they disagree, where they can rationalize how they're right and how their hard-heartedness towards God is rationalized and it's, it's reasonable. It makes sense to be hard and cold towards God. There's a man not here today because there were children killed a few weeks ago by a madman that sinned against God before he sinned against the children. Satan come to steal, kill, and destroy. God come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But that's been laid at the feet of God, and he's not in church today because he just came. How could God do that? As though God did that. The stupidity, the stupidity that fills the earth on who God is and what God does is rampant. It's rampant. John sees Jesus, his head and hair of wool, his eyes of fire, his feet of brass, the voice of many waters, the two-edged sword coming out in his right hand, the stars. But notice last, his sun shines, his countenance as the sun that shines at midday. John got a glimpse of that on the Mount of Transfiguration as Peter, James, and John were there and the Shekinah glory that was veiled in the flesh of the Son of Man laid back and the glory and the splendor of the Son of God. And they fell on their face there and wanted to build tabernacles and never leave. The Apostle Paul experienced it on the road to Damascus. He gave testimony. He said, it was brighter than the sun at noon on its brightest day. It's your kind of glory of God. The countenance that puts to shame anything even the sun in its splendid glory. We're going to read of the new Jerusalem. It has no sun, has no moon. Why? It don't need one. The glory, the glory of holy God 
lights the place eternally. There is no night. There is no dark. In Him is no darkness, no shadow of turning at all. It's the eternal glory and brightness. And John sees Jesus in His countenance greater than the noonday sun. He sees Him there. Does that change how you see Jesus today? I hope that it would. It has me. I hope that it will. When you think of Jesus today, He's not bleating, beaten and bloodied. He's not humiliated and spit upon. He's raised and glorified. He's taken His place that was His. When He prayed in John 17, Father, I want my bride to be with me that they can see the glory that I had with you before the foundation of the world. He's there in that glory now and He's waiting on the day when the Father says, go get your bride and He's going to bring us all to Him to be with Him in that glory. But we've got to finish. Y'all not been listening nearly fast enough. Verse 19. If you mark your Bible at all, please mark verse 19. Put a line under each of the word things. How, how locked up would something be if they left a key hanging by the front door? Right here at the door of Revelation, the door of when all of the time of Jacob's trouble is about to unfold, God hangs the key. He hangs the map. He says, I'm going to give you the outline of the book so that you can't possibly get confused and get messed up by it. There's three things in this map, three things that are there. Notice what he says, verse 19. He says, write the things which you have seen, past tense, the vision he just gave us. The eyewitness that he was all the days of Jesus' life. The things that you have seen, including this vision of Jesus. He says, write that. John's written it. He's written it and sent it. He says the second things. And the things which are current. He's about to write to the seven churches in chapter 2 and chapter 3. Those things which are still there and are still in existence when John writes. But then the third division. And the things which will take place after this. Metatotal. After this. There's the outline of the book. The things are chapter 1. The things are the things that were that you've seen. The things that are chapter 2 and chapter 3. When we get to chapter 4 in verse 1 twice. Twice in verse 1. Of chapter 4, we read Metatata. And everything that takes place in chapter 4 onward is after the church age is concluded and over and done. And the church is not heard from again in all of the revelation until chapter 19 there in the wedding scene of the Lord's Supper in heaven. It becomes a time of Jacob's trouble when God turns again to the nation Israel and he takes up Jewish history once again. And he brings it to the fulfillment of the millennial kingdom when David's greatest son is going to rule and reign just like God prophesied he would to Israel. He's going to do it. If you'll keep those three things straight, even the internet won't confuse you. <laughs> keep them straight. The things which I've seen, chapter 1, the things which are, chapter 2 and 3, the things which will happen after this, chapter 4, verse 2 onward, to chapter 19. God's judgment on the kingdoms of the earth, on a rebellious people who turn their heart and their eyes away from Christ. As I said earlier, I thought it was fitting that today on Father's Day we'd see Jesus in His glorified, resurrected place. See Him as He is today and as He will be from evermore. That when we see Jesus, when we think of Jesus, we'd see Him as He truly is. Because see, what a great negative impact that is to the cause of Satan. He wants us to think of Christ as this crucified, beaten, and buried. He wants us to see Him resurrected and ruling and reigning and about to bring judgment on all of Satan's plans for the earth when He, sub, with His subterfuge, He stole from Adam and Eve uh, their lordship over the earth and became prince and power of the air. He, he don't want to see that that's coming to an end, that's coming to a close, and He has no hope, no hope, no hope of winning ultimately. 
not even a battle, not even a fight, just out of the mouth, just out of the spoken word, all of it's dealt with and defeated. Today, when people look at my home who don't know Jesus, when they look at how I live, how I treat my wife, how we treated our children, how we treat our grandchildren, how, how we treat each other, when people look, do they see a Christ figure in the home of a Christian family? Now, we want them to look with grace. We want them to look with kindness because we're not Jesus. We're not Jesus. Or we'd be the Christ figure in our home. Hopefully, we can be enough like Him they recognize who they see in us. That it's not us, but it's Him who's being our all in all and being everything in us. Today, John gives to us what Jesus wanted us to see. He said, write this and send it to my churches. I want them to see me today. I want to see me for who I am. Glory, glory, glory to the Lord God. See my eyes. I'm going to judge this old world that ridiculed me, this old world that spit in my face, this old world that slapped me and pulled my beard, that nailed me. Hey, they didn't get over it. They didn't get away with it. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. This old governments of this world that have, that have put God out of, the, out of the schools, that have put God out of the public arena, here trying to put God out of every nook and cranny of, of, of the governmental touch. Separation of church and state, not even in our Constitution. Not a word of it in our Constitution. Not a word of it. Concepts never there. Just the opposite. Every sign of the Constitution, every one of them understood that it took a people of God who submitted themselves to the sovereign uh, uh, God of the universe to be this kind of people and to be a free people. But these governments that have thumbed their nose at God and these leaders that have raised up and pronounced themselves God and demanded worship in one form or the other, one day the brass heel of the Savior is going to be on the neck and the head of the serpent and He's going to crush it. Crush it. Crush it. And either today, the two-edged sword, the message of the two-edged sword will be for me and for you. It will be either the message of life where we humble ourselves and receive the gospel of Christ or be the message of death and ultimate, ultimate defeat that we reject it. Reject it. Well, you know, I would be saved, but there's all them hypocrites. Come on, there's room for one more. Come on. Every lost man I know is a hypocrite too. Preacher, your church full of hypocrites? Yep, we got room for one more. Come on. What does that mean? None of us live up to the Jesus that we love and serve. None of us live to the perfection of the Spirit of God in us. None of us do. Does that make us hypocrites? I say it makes us human. Paul said, This flesh in me and this flesh dwells no good thing for how to do good is present with me, how to perform that which is good I find not. The Apostle Paul said, Man, I blow it. There's days I blow it. If you think I don't, just ask my wife. I blow it. I blow it. The hypocrisy of saying, I'm not going to receive the grace and love of Jesus for my sin because other people don't live the way I think they should is a hypocrisy in itself. Lay down. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. Come just like you are, sinner, sin and all, and find in Him who knows you and still loves you willing to save you, to cleanse you, and to forgive you. And if you've been one of the churches, we're going to look about next week, not to get too far ahead, but this morning as Jesus knows you, if He was going to write a letter to you, which of the seven letters would most resemble the letter to you? Would it be a good letter? Would it be a letter of Filled with commendation after condemna commendation or would it be condemnation after condemnation? I have somewhat against thee. I have somewhat against thee. I have somewhat against thee. This morning, before a risen, glorified Savior who's in the midst of His churches saying, come to me. Come to me. Will you come? Will you come? I pray you will. If there's any distance between where you were the day He saved you and where you are now, would you traverse back over the distance in repentance and confession and come again to a first love, a first love of Jesus? Be saved. Return unto Him. Repent and return. 
get a head start on next Sunday sermon. Let's pray about it. Heavenly Father.